Hey everybody, welcome back to Faith and Culture. Today my guest is Chris Hilkin, and we're gonna be talking about a number of subjects, but as we have been with Faith and Culture, what we would love to talk about is of course faith journeys. We love looking at people's faith journeys and what that means to them today in this culture. But the whole idea of this podcast is to really help people understand how do we apply our faith to the different cultural situations that are around us today. So I welcome my guest, Chris Hilkin. Thanks for joining us today, Chris. Thanks, man. I'm Glad start. you're with us, man. Yeah, so what we're going to do is just kind of start out. I want to hear uh, about your kind of upbringing. Where did you grow up? Tell me about like your family and then from there, how you got into ministry. Yeah. So my dad, uh, I grew up I was born at seminary when my dad was training to be a pastor up in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And so, what seminary was uh, uh, Concordia, oh, okay. Fort Wayne. Yeah. So I was born there. So I really brought up in like the tradition, brought up in church. Yeah, it was very common for me, obviously, to see my dad preaching on the weekend. So um, I, I, I wouldn't even be able to tell you like a moment of faith. It just was always kind of a part of my experience. And um, but grew up doing a lot of like different Bible stuff, Awanas. And so I had all these biblical answers, uh, but kind of lacked like the spiritual depth. Like if there's a new Testament character that I would identify with, it'd be like the Pharisees as a whole, mm. right? Like I, um, I likened myself better than people because I was doing more things. I knew more things. Like I read Bible trivia for fun. It was like, yeah, I didn't have a lot of friends. So <laughs> I was going to say. It's kind of bad, right? Um, no, it's good. It's but good as that, and then as that matures, I kind of realized that as I was kind of intellectually maturing and in, in, in those other areas, that the the church ceased to be able to answer a lot of the questions of faith that I was having. And so this was kind of early on in my high school experience, where I just started to question the validity of the Christian scriptures, the validity of the the God hypothesis in general, the validity of all those things. So I found, I found the church to be good, just not true. Mm. And so, um, but there's this whole field that I never understood before, like Christian thinkers, you know, D.A. Carson, William Lane Craig, C.S. Lewis, these uh, kind of brilliant minds of faith. I was just never exposed to them. And the different people who had pastored me early on, youth pastors or people at my school or whatever, they um, they kept feeding me this idea that if um, that people who follow Jesus are supposed to be faith based people, which means um, you don't have evidence for why you believe what you believe. And, and I just always thought to myself, like that seems like the answer you would give if what you were saying was false. Mm-hmm. If you're trying to convince someone of a lie, you would tell them just take it on blind faith, right? It's I mean, it's essentially the 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 worldview of the communist regimes of like don't don't ask questions, just take it carte blanche. And so that kind of led me to this bout of like reading atheist thinkers, Daniel Dennett, Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins. Uh, And I remember finished reading those and kind of finding what they thought to be pretty intellectually bankrupt too. I I, I feel like there was a lot of questions that I had after reading that. And then I finally started reading people um, on both sides and understanding the worldview. And I really found that Christianity for me was was a much more reasonable worldview to have, and so I didn't really have like this come to Jesus moment of like a deep some deep emotional interaction. I didn't find myself like worshiping in the middle of a, a service and and feeling that overwhelming sense of the Spirit. It was it was really more of a decision mm. of like I uh, I can't reject the truth of this, and so I'm going to give my life to it. And I think because I had pushed and prodded and, and teased out every other worldview, I was so incredibly convinced that it was true that I had a really hard time doing anything that wasn't um, about Jesus. It just seemed like, well, if this is true, and he's the God of the universe, and life is short, and the book of James says it's here today and gone tomorrow, I should probably do something with this truth. And So I wanted to be a, a pastor originally, went to college, and um, in the, my pastoral classes kind of found like, I'm not quite sure I want to be a pastor like this. Got a call when I was graduating to come to North Coast Church down in San Diego, North County. You guys, when you're in San Diego, you can't call it San Diego. Yeah. Everywhere else in the country, you have to say San Diego because they don't know what yeah. Bonzel and Oceanside is. But um, So I thought, okay, I'll go do that, but I want to do marriage and family therapy, but I'll, do, I'll, I'll put one year in as a youth pastor. Why, that? Why marriage and family therapy? Uh, I just, I feel like that was lacking in the space. Um, there's a family that was good family friends of ours and they were actually struggling with, uh, sexual, like, uh, the sexual dysfunction in their relationship. And they had to drive like two hours to find a Christian, um, therapist that was able to come at that through a biblical worldview. And I thought that was pretty tragic. You know, if God invented sex and invented the human form and invented marriage, we should have more people in that space that are giving opinions and that are, um, teaching, so that's what I wanted to do. Went to North Coast for one year. 
I realized there's a different way to do church. There's a different way to be a pastor um, that you can actually answer questions that the students are asking. And I watched students as a youth pastor really make life changes. Like not just an intellectual one like I had made previously and not like a pharisaic one of I'm better than you, but watching kids go from like addiction to freedom and watching them go from um, yeah atheism to belief and watching them go from uh, hooking up with their girlfriends, like following Jesus. And I just, I, I had never experienced actual life change before. Um, and so I just kind of became an addiction. And that was 11 years ago at this point. And so that kind of started my journey as like a, so as a pastor. Take me back to, was it high school you were, you were reading those things? Or so yeah. in high school you're kind of trying to figure that out and you're, right. you're reading all that stuff. And, um, and then so going to North Coast, and how did that all come about? So you're in college, you said, you get a call from North Coast, and they're looking at you for a youth pastor, I assume. Right. And so you're looking at a youth pastor position. You'd wanted to do marriage and family therapy. And so what what was clear about the call to North Coast? Or was it wasn't. It, yeah, it was just, fuzzy. It was, um, I, there was a guy named Martin who worked for Youth for Christ in Bakersfield, which is, so I moved around a lot when my dad was like planting churches and moving around. So we went from... Uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, to Texas, to I spent 12 years in Oklahoma, so I'm a Sooners fan, mm. which That's don't hold that against me. That's too bad. Go Irish. <laughs> you guys are crushing <laughs> it. Right. Um, and then out to Bakersfield, my dad was um, a pastor for a long time. In Bakersfield, after I'd kind of come to, to faith and understanding, I started working with our, our Christian club at our at the high school I was going to, and it kind of blew up. It was one of the bigger ones in the country. And so Youth for Christ came in and said, we're going to use the model that you're using to plant other Christian clubs around Bakersfield and beyond. And the guy that was running that program was a Martin. Martin ended up then changing from Youth for Christ to get a job at North Coast. And he told me, when you graduate, I want to work with you. So the oh, day okay. that I graduated, he called me and said, do you still want to work with me? And I was like, are you doing Youth for Christ? He's like, no, I'm at a church called North Coast. So I went... Cool. I'll go down. I'd gotten injured, and I wanted to play football, too. So I was going to go rehab for a year, take a year off of school, work as a youth pastor to make ends meet, and then go back off and finish my schooling. So that's kind of how that came about. Okay. So what did you study? Did you study marriage and family therapy at in Concordia is where you went? Yeah. So theological studies and b- biblical languages, and um, I had a minor in psychology because so I went in thinking that I wanted to do uh, be a pastor. And so... I remember a guy told me one time, he said, so few people go into the actual field that they study. Like, just study what you're passionate about. And I knew I was passionate about the Bible, but I wanted to apply it through marriages. And so that was the, that was kind of my directive. Okay. So you're at North Coast and you're youth pastoring and um, it's, it's probably growing, I imagine, with the kids and all that. And you're learning, you're getting your feet wet in terms of preaching consistently and all that. And what, what is the sense there at North Coast in terms of, okay, was there a call on you? Did you sense any kind of call like, okay, I'm going to be here for this amount of time, and then I'm going to do this, uh, and then I'm going to do that or whatever? What was it at North Coast? How long were you there, first of all, as a youth pastor? How long were you doing youth? Was that always your job? Yeah, I did it the whole way through. Oh, okay. Up and I, I worked with the high school ministry until COVID, and then COVID, right before COVID, I moved to the young adult ministry, and then I was doing both of those. Co- I was doing high school and young adults. I was leading both those programs. Oh, okay. And then I was kind of the, you know, the what's that, the guy that slaps stuff onto the glue guy, you know, <laughs> the, fix this, fix, fix the, it, yeah, tape, yeah. whatever that oh, stuff's yeah, called. Yeah. Um, until COVID was over, until they found another youth guy. So I was doing both of those things. Okay. When I was 24, I became a teaching pastor at North Coast. So I was doing the young adult ministry, the high school ministry, and I was a teaching pastor at the at same 24. time. At 24, is that what you said? When I was 24, yeah. You're 24 years old. You become a teaching pastor of a really large church. Yeah. Um, and so obviously the gifting, people are recognizing your gift. And how often are you teaching at North Coast at that point, in terms of on the regular services? In like the, we call the it main big church. church. What do you call it? Big church. Yeah, big church. Uh, the first year once. It was really all the dates that the, the big guys didn't want. Oh, so right you after know? Christmas. And yeah, that. right <laughs> after Christmas or like they'd have like a conference and the weekend after the conference. Yeah. So like once or twice and then 
um, I think probably when I was 25 or 26, that moved to like eight or nine. Okay. And then up to like, I think 12 was the most I did in it in a year. So we had a three man teaching team okay. and I was one third of that teaching team. Okay. So you're there. Uh, your total time at North Coast was how long? 11 years. So you were there 11 years total. Yeah. So you really grew up in ministry and I mean there in terms of getting, getting an understanding of what ministry is about and, uh, and all of that. So uh, take me through uh, the process of you, you're at North Coast. When did you meet Paige and kind of how did, how did that all come about? So I met Paige right before I left Concordia. So I was a senior when she was a freshman and uh, she walked on campus and we were, as a group of guys, we would like go and help the freshmen move into their dorms, oh, you know, that's nice just out of the you. kindness yeah, of our you're heart. Just so sweet. <laughs> you know? <laughs> And, and so people just started talking about this girl named Paige and I had no, I had no interaction with her or anything. And then I saw her one day and it was just one of those things is like, you know, like Martin Luther, he was like caught in a storm. He's like, God, if you save me, I will become a monk. It was kind of like that. It was like, man, God, if, if she shows any interest in me, I just, I don't know what I'll do. Like I'll, you know, freak out. And it was just a long process of like trying to get her to notice me. And it was the, the whole year and, and like chasing her down and pursuing that and things and really didn't give me the time of day. Um, and then towards the end of the year, we started having different interactions and I started doing some like pretty uh, uh, big, like demonstrative stuff for her, you know, like, uh, but getting her roses and, and having things show up at right times to her dorm rooms and everything. And I'm a, like a broke college student, but I'm like, again, it's like the treasure in the field. It's like, <laughs> I'll sell everything as long as I yes. can, can get her attention. Did you and sing so, for her? No. You never sang I, for her? But I, I bro, this is, uh, I, she's like, I've always wanted to learn how to play guitar. And I you play guitar. I'm like, yeah, out of the goodness of my heart, like I'd, I'd love to teach you guitar. And so that was kind of like the guy's by which everything started. Yeah. And so she would come to the worship service that I helped to lead at, at Concordia. And she, so she heard me teach a couple times. And so it was kind of through that avenue that we got mm. to know each other. And um, so our love just kind of developed like through that. And then when I went down to North Coast, I was like, you still have, you know, two ish, three more years of school left. She ended up finishing in, in three years. Um, but like, this would be a great time to either break this off or if we continue, it's probably going to mean something a little bit more than just two people dating. Cause we're going to be, we're going to have a distance between us. Like yeah. you're going to be, you're doing schooling. She was, she was bio pre-med. She was on the softball team where they won a national championship. So like real deal softball player. Um, and she graduated cum, summa cum laude. So she's like wow. a, she's like a brilliant athletic driven woman and I'm going down to North coast to be a youth pastor. So I'm like, it makes total sense. You'd break up with me. Yeah. Like, <laughs> What are you thinking? Give her an opportunity. <laughs> but she was like, yeah, I think I want to see this through. So we did. So you're dating at that point, but when did you ask her to, to marry you? And Yeah, so kind of we got engaged process? in um, September of 2012, I want to say. And then we got married June of 2013 um, in Bakersfield. And so that was kind of when, that was when all that stuff kind of picked up and we you know, we had a lot of conversations about it. Like, is this what we want to do? Is this what you want to do? And she started coming down to North Coast on the weekends. And when I met her, she did not know anything about the Bible, right? It's probably like, if I were to advise myself now as a pastor, I would go, you guys are unequally yoked. Like you, you know, I remember using some analogies early on with her, like, you know, I feel like Jonah. And I remember her saying like, who's Jonah? Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, but I was so infatuated already. I'm like, well, yeah. now I can't walk away from you. Yeah. Um, but also, she also had a, an incredible willingness, and, and she was probably what you would consider like a cultural Christian. Like she, they went to you know, her family went to church and everything. She went to church on like major holidays and stuff, mm -hmm. but um, couldn't really, it wouldn't be able to explain the gospel to you. Yeah. Um, you know, it's probably more Christus exemplar. Like God's a good person; we should be good people. That's what the Christianity is all about. And she would come down to church at North Coast on the weekends, and it would it was like illuminating. Like I watched mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit illuminating her through the teaching and not even my teaching. She would go to like big church and hear Chris and Larry and she would be like, I get it. And it's like making a lot more sense to me now. And so I, it was, it was really fun to watch her like walk through that and understand those things. So, mm -hmm. and then 2013, June of 2013, we got married. And then we How were, old were you at that point? In I was 25. She got married 25. She okay. was uh, 19. 19. Yeah. yeah. So she won a national championship. She graduated summa cum laude and we got married within 10 days. It was all in, the, in one big fell swoop. And then we were pregnant six months later, I think, with our yeah. first kid. Wow. So we just kind of like went through it. Okay, so, so you, have your, uh, you have your first child, and 
you're full on at North Coast. You got the busyness of ministry and you're growing stuff, all of that. Uh, and then you have another kid, right? right? So how, I mean, you end up having five kids. Mm-hmm. And so that's just a constant thing going on um, in, in, in life and in ministry. How are you trying to balance that in terms of, or did you, were you balancing it at all? Because I know personally how hard it is to balance ministry. We have, you know, three boys and it was an incredible challenge. And, I, and so I'm thinking with five, wow. But just kind of take me through that process. Okay, you have one, and then you're, you're still, you know, you're st- swimming. You got the new, the new child. Then you have a second one, and then a third. So just kind of take me through that in terms of the struggles and the yeah. busyness. And it, it's, it's interesting to watch. It's what Paul says in the New Testament. He says, it's better that you guys stay, stay single mm-hmm. if you can help it. If not, then get married and do really well with that. And you don't really understand that until you have kids and you go, wow, my... My ministry is very divided. Like the the further you get in life with kids and, and family and stuff, the more um, the, the sharper your focus must become in ministry because you have other people to minister to. And I don't mean that in terms of terms of resentment because there's nothing more enjoyable than loving my wife. There's nothing more incredible than raising those kids. But it does mean you say no to a lot more things, and it, that can be difficult because you watch then opportunities pass you by in right. your professional world, just going I, that doesn't have my name on it because it can't. I think we did that pretty well. She got into multi-level marketing at one point, and she's brilliant in that kind of stuff. She was great with like social media. She, I mean, she was hungry. She had four different businesses that she ran while homeschooling our kids, while having multiple kids. Like she was just at a, the same time four businesses. Oh uh, yeah, while having yes, yeah, powerhouse. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so really, it was probably more of a struggle for her than it was for me. It was more. I was a little bit more of the person going help. You know. Like, <laughs> Check back in. I still love you. You know, which when we first got married, she, 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 I think everyone, including her, would have told you that she probably had this over obsessiveness with me. Like if I went to go um, play football with my friends on a Saturday, it was like we had to have a really big sit down conversation about, you know, like this doesn't mean I like them more than you. I think a lot of like marriages go through that where you're like, this, yeah. this doesn't mean they're better than you. This is like, so we had to walk through that. And then at one point when she was, so I, I remember I would come home from work and she would like hand me the kids and then go upstairs and work on her business. And uh, I remember telling her one time, I said like, I can, I can operate like this because um, I made a vow to you that I'm never going to leave. But is this my new normal? Is my new normal that we just co-parent and then we have our two different passions or like what what's this going to be? Mm-hmm. And that led to a really good like come to Jesus moment in our marriage. Um where we were able to kind of hash that out and talk about what's our family mission statement? Who do we want to be as people? At that, when we're both 85 holding hands on our deathbed and we say we made it, what does we made it mean? Yeah. Does that mean we built these businesses? Does that mean we reached more people for Jesus? Does it mean we have 19 kids? Like what does we made it mean? Yeah. So that was the first time we kind of like settled that down and, and that changed everything for us. Yeah, I think this is something like for everyone listening or watching is, is, is understanding even like the life of a pastor there's so many, you know, every pastor is different and all that, and families are different. But I think what people don't understand about pastoring is that you're human beings, that you have, you know, you have this, this church that you're trying to shepherd, the people you're trying to shepherd, but your most important is at home. You're trying to shepherd your family, and you got pressures at home, and then you go to church, especially if you have a large church, or whether you're leading it or you're part of a large church, it's like all the pressures that come with that. Because you want to be available, right? You want to be available for your wife. You want to be available for your kids. Well, if you have thousands of people at church, you want to be available for them. Um, and so it's impossible. You can't. Yeah. Well, it's not just pressures, it. like you're saying. You also have to include the criticisms yeah. and the weight of what you deal with as a pastor. Like as a pastor, you have the honor of being with people on their best day, but you also have the privilege of being with people on their hardest day. And you don't, you know, sometimes like when, when I'm at a, I was teaching at a youth pastor's conference a couple weeks back and this guy's like, I just want to go work at Domino's. Like you finish serving the pizza and you don't think about like, man, I wonder how their night went. Or, you know, I know about the abuse in that household. And that's like a real thing. You, you are, you know, behind the scenes of so many people's lives and you carry that with you. And then you invite everyone to vote vote on how you're doing as a pastor yeah. and what you said this weekend. Absolutely. And you've got thousands of hours of recorded content that people can pull back up and go and criticize. You know what I mean? It's like, there's a lot that goes into it. And then you try to juggle the family inside of that and realize it's not just the time. It's the mental mortgage of being a pastor too, mm-hmm. that you carry your job with you. And you, you know, you could have 300 people who tell you good job on Sunday, right? It's happened to me last week. 
so many compliments. I was like so encouraged by it. And then one person gave me feedback on how I could have delivered it better. <laughs> and that's all I can remember. Yeah, I know. Right? Like I can't remember the other people's names. I can't remember <laughs> what they said. I don't remember their specific <laughs> compliments. But I can tell you like the timbre tone and the motivation of his voice, exactly how he said, I got a little bit of feedback for you on the way you presented that message. Like I'll never forget it. And that's yep. like such a bummer. <laughs> This is the way we're. <laughs> I know who that is, but you, you uh, know who I'm talking. About. Uh, yeah, but you know, it's funny you mentioned the Domino's thing. Working at Domino's is planting the church. We had a, a group of church planters, and we called it the Home Depot fantasy. It was, why did we do this? Like, why yeah. did why did we get in church planting? And then it was, wouldn't it be great to work at Home Depot, just like nine to five, and you clock out, you're done. Yeah, like you go home, and, you know, go watch football or whatever. You don't even have to think about like what you just said is so true that it's always swimming around in there and it just adds that level that level of stress. And so you're you're at North Coast, you're cranking uh, with ministry, life. Let's say now fast forward, you have five kids. Right. What at what point are you uh, it was after the fifth kid, I think you mentioned it at some point that Paige kind of was having yeah. some struggles. And so can you share a little bit about yeah. that? So we don't, ha- I mean, we don't have more than a couple of weeks of five kids feeling like our family is complete before everything kind of goes south, which is uh, probably within the first 48 hours after she gives birth, she just has this really bad back pain. And she's so good at love. Our fifth uh, child's name Finley, and she's just this little delight. And so she's like nursing her and stuff. And she's, she, my wife's just not a complainer right? Like she just, nothing really bothers her. Like I said, she gave birth in the corner of our bedroom in 59 minutes. Like, boom, she just, nothing phases her. And so she started complaining as she would, she would sleep sitting up so that she could still nurse and everything. But she was sleeping on the couch in like an upright position because her back hurt so bad. And, um, everyone was just like, well, of course you just gave birth. Like it, you strained a muscle, you did something else like that. And so I finally called the guy and I said, like, this isn't getting any better. And it's now affecting like her sleep schedule. And he said, come on in 98% chance. It's a back strain, 2% chance. It could be like a pulmonary embolism, which is potentially life threatening. I'm I'm outside on the phone. Like, did you just say life threatening? Like she's like holistic health, essential oils. Like she doesn't eat sugar. She's, you know, she's, um, certified health coach, nutritionist, all this stuff. And so I walk inside and I told her, like, he said it could be possibly be a pulmonary embolism. And, and something that people don't know is she was following two people on social media, two of her friends that were females who both died in the past three or four months, having had multiple kids. And after their third, fourth or fifth kid, whichever one it was, had died of pulmonary embolisms. And then their husbands had posted on their feed, this person passed away. And so the, the word pulmonary embolism meant nothing to me and it meant everything to her. So she shared with me later, as she was experiencing this back pain, she had those ruminating thoughts of what if this is the same thing? And I, you know, I was oblivious to all that until I called. And so, but when I said that word to her, could be pulmonary, I just watched like um, this kind of look of terror, as scared as she gets, go over her. And so we're driving to the hospital to get it checked out. And she's clinging to my arm on like the armrest, just not page behavior. Mm -hmm. And um, so then she gets diagnosed with a pulmonary embolism and she wakes up in the middle of the night thinking she's dying that next night, uh, thinking that it had spread to her heart and it was killing her. And they so, give her like blood thinners or something? Yeah. Like said, hey, take these. You're and that was part armor. of it too. She was so about like kind of the organic everything, wanted to mm-hmm. nurse. And they said, um, you can't nurse if you go on X blood thinner, but if you go on this one over here, you have to give yourself three injections a day. So she had to give herself, and she, she passed out at the idea of, thought, of shots, but she so wanted to continue to breastfeed that she was giving herself three shots a day because she wanted to continue that for Finley. And so it just started this weird period where she was having to give herself these injections and everything. And um, that's when she started not sleeping. Is that like days or weeks? Like she's giving the injections? Days. So for several days she's doing this. Yeah. It was supposed to be longer than that, but um, her sleeplessness got so bad that they switched her to like warfarin or something like that, which then she had to take um, in a different means and, and wasn't injecting it anymore. Um, after that night that she just, she thought she was dying. So we, we kind of had a panic all hands on deck thing and that, but that started 10 nights of her not sleeping at all. And that's when you know, every day we would go back to the ER and go like, she didn't sleep. Like, what are we going to do? And it's like, every time we went back, they would like pull back the curtain on like the more danger zone, you know, like the, the, the restricted area, like take this pill. And, and every time they would go, they would go like, Hey, this is going to knock her out. You know, like you give her a little bit of this and a little bit of here's an Ambien and here's Benadryl and here's melatonin, this combination of these, right? And they're like, and my wife's just like 
Hmm. She's just going through it. She's like staring at me. It's like two in the morning and she's not sleeping. And so then on, on day seven, she woke me up and she's like, I just went to the bathroom, but everything I saw, everything I looked at, I pictured the way that it could kill me. And I was like, oh man, like things are attacking you. Like, are you having, she's like, no, I was thinking about ways to end my own life. And what, what did you do in that moment? Like, what was your reaction to that? I tried to be as imagine. calm as possible. Okay. I tried just to go, um, because her problem all throughout it was the new norm. Like, this is going to be the way that I am for the rest of my life. I'm never going to sleep again. I'm never going to. And she had begun to even, like, create distance between herself and Finley. So, in, you know, she was always a baby hog everywhere. Mm-hmm. And we were having to, like, Paige, you need to feed. Mm-hmm. Like, Paige, you need to do this. Paige, you need to do very simplistic things. And, and she was just kind of in her own world. And she was a researcher, too. So when things were happening, she was Googling everything and finding all these stories. And, right, like, what makes press is not the success. was It's like everyone's new. You know, this is what happens to everyone. And mm-hmm. So I just told her, I said, you haven't slept in a while. Like the brain can play crazy tricks on you. And then, I, but I just kept asking her, like, do you, do you want to kill yourself? She's like, no. It's like, do you? Are you sad about something? She's like, no. I don't feel sad at all. I just feel like that's the closest thing I can get to sleep, and I just have to sleep somehow. Mm-hmm. And so I, I was teaching that night at the Jordan, the young adult ministry up in North County, and so we, I stayed up for the rest of the night, and then it was time for me to go to the Jordan, and I didn't feel safe leaving her at home, so I brought her with me, and we were sitting in my truck, and I was, like, prepping for the sermon, thinking she was going to come in and sit with me, and she was like, I don't think you can go teach right now without being able to observe me. And, and my wife, she's not dramatic. She doesn't have a history of this. She's not attention-seeking anything, and so... I like scrambled, you know, the, the fire trucks. I like, I called my buddy who I knew was on campus, who's a professional psychologist and, and his team got together. And so they sat with me and her and asked questions, very poignant ones. Like, do you have a plan to kill yourself? Do you want to kill yourself? Do you, do you imagine that being a good outlet right now? Do you do? And so I went up and I, they were like, you go do your sermon. We're going to watch her and we're going to do all these assessments and everything. And we're going to give you a recommendation by the end of it. So I remember getting up on stage and I just like, I just told them what was going on. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't hide it. Um, cause I always, you know, I talk about authenticity. So I got up on stage and I'm just like weeping going like, I guess I don't know what's going on. I don't get this. Like it, the prayer seems simple, you know, like deliver her from this. And so they prayed for me. We all were kind of there and it was this pretty, I, I, I think transformational moment for even the ministry that, that I got to be a part of there at the Jordan where people were like, Oh, so it's not just pastors who go through this. It's pastors' wives who otherwise are superheroes who are now sitting there thinking about, like, taking their own life. And, you know, like, no one's immune to the, the cancer of sin. And so, and what it does to people's brains, what it does to people's bodies, and what it does to culture in general. And so that night we, we drove down to, to Sharp Mesa Verde down in here in San Diego and dropped her off. And I just remember thinking to myself, like, this is a joke. Like, is this, is like Ashton Kutcher going to pop up? Like, yeah. am I getting punked? Like, what's going on? I'm like sitting in the waiting room and she's like talking about her intake orders and the guy who's intaking us goes to North Coast. So he like recognizes me. He's like, hey, how's it going? Uh, and I'm like explaining, you know, and, and Paige had such a great way of like in those moments, she was just Paige and everyone's like, that's why she kept getting taken out of hospitals yeah. because she'd be able to in those moments go, oh man, everything's good. I'm, yeah. I'm totally, I like, I, I had these things, I, I've been thinking these thoughts, they've been pretty intense, but she was so coherent while she was talking about suicidal thoughts that people kept going like, I think she's fine. So she was there for a few nights, they gave her like Seroquel and these, like a horse tranquilizer basically to get her to fall asleep and every day during the time she was down there, I think it was five or six days total, I would make the drive down for lunch, there's only certain visiting hours you can have, I'd bring her the same meal every day and we would eat our um, Rubio's in, in the, like the courtyard and it was like her and then a lot of people who were in like drug situations or addictions or whatever who, or um, they, they've been there for a long time or they've been there over and over again and Paige was talking to them like is this my new normal? Is this like the way that my life's going to be? I remember her asking me like what if I never get better? And I just told her, I said like if you never get better then it will be my great pleasure to spend the rest of my life stewarding the vow that I gave for sickness and in, like in sickness and health for rich or poor like I'll, we'll just follow you around mm-hmm. like I got nothing better to do with my life than to serve you and to be there with you and and I, I think that kind of almost freaked her out where she was like you have to go you need to go do what you need to do like you mm-hmm. need to carry on you can't just sit here and wait for your 
crazy wife to get better. Like I'm not getting better. And that's what it was like. She was just convinced. I'm just not going to get fixed. And she got out of there. I threw a surprise birthday party for her on July 21st and on July 22nd, or I think it was July 22nd, I was sitting next to her on like the balcony at our house and she just jumped off of it. Like randomly. She, I mean, it was, it it was, you know, it's 11 feet to the ground in the living room and our kids were playing down there and she literally, we were hugging, we were talking about what we were going to do that day. And I was telling her, I'm going to be with you. It's going to be fine. She's like, I just feel like something inside of me is telling me I just have to. And then she just jumped off the edge of it and she like lands on the ground below and looks up at me. She's like, what's wrong with me? And then she comes back upstairs. We call the psychologist and like, hey, this is what just happened. What do we do? And again, as soon as she gets out of that, she gets back into like normal mode. You know, it's almost like this itch she had to keep scratching yeah. of like putting herself in those different positions. And um, So at this point now, you've she had five nights or so at the hospital. Was she, was she sleeping with a tranquilizer? Was she able to get to sleep? There was, there's disagreement there. Her uh, nurses would say she was sleeping and she would say, I was closing my eyes or I didn't want them to keep checking on me. So I would, so I, I don't know for don't sure. Know. Um, so you come home and she's still having all the issues. Yeah. All the stuff. Okay. So then she, what were you thinking when she jumps off of the balcony right there? Were you just going, okay, here we go. This has become a safety issue for my family. Yeah. Because um, she was, she landed three feet away from my newborn baby who was getting changed on the ground, which is why I was upstairs because she had finally woken up. So I walked wow. upstairs to greet her yeah. and say good morning to her. And she, I, I said, this has now become dangerous for them. Mm-hmm. And, and even thinking, I don't want them to grow up thinking that their mom was dangerous because she's not, she's just not herself. And so then we, I just kind of said, what's my next step? And really all, I mean, and we had a great team and Paige was always open with it. She, she had made posts on social media. She had talked to people about it. She, there wasn't like, and that's what a lot of people naturally jump to, right? The things you can Google about how she died of like, oh, well, this is the pressure of a pastor's wife. It's like, first of all, she loved being a pastor's wife. Secondly, she was not a traditional pastor's wife. She was not there leading Bible studies or anything else like that. She was, you know, she like didn't, she wasn't born in the church and brought up in the church where she knew how to play nice. She just was unequivocally her. Mm. And anyone who knows her would know those things. And so she was talking to people about it. She was, she was very verbal about it. She was having conversations. So our care team through North Coast, through their different counselors, she had a personal psychologist too, and a psychiatrist, and a, um, a sleep specialist, an EMDR specialist. Like No matter what, we tried everything. And they said, hey, I think it's time to think about like long-term inpatient stuff. And so they're like, all the inpatient things are about 30 days long. And she, at first, when she first was struggling, she's like, I'll never do that. I can't be away from you for that long. I don't want to be, and I can't be away from the kids for that long. And then after this happened, she's like, I think you're right. I think I need to do this. So she was coherent enough to know that she had begun to endanger more than just her. So you know, at night I would lock the doors and I would, I would lock the room that she was in and I would go sleep in the kids' room next to the door to make sure she wouldn't come in there, but know that if she moved or touched anything, these alarms would go off so that I could come and take care of her. So I was spending most of the night going back and forth between my kid's room where I was with all the five kids, including the newborn, bottle feeding her three or four times a night, and then going back upstairs and checking on Paige every time I heard anything, even if she'd go into the bathroom, I'd have to walk her to the bathroom and walk her back in bed. And and always with the promise of like, someday this is going to get better. And then that inpatient thing came up and so we flew out to Tucson um, to this place that was like highly touted as being great for um, people who have uh, PTSD. And that's mm. really what they think the, the core of everything was, is that the lack of sleep um, created trauma. That trauma led to all these other things. And they basically said, if you want to start treating the insomnia, if you want to start st- treating the anxiety, if you want to start treating the psychosis and all those things, you need to start with the trauma. And so they said that's like step one. So... Went out to Tucson, and uh, she, I went out there with her. She was in the facility, and she talked to me as it, she she said goodbye to me. Like she was saying, mm. um, like as she's having these conversations, she's telling me um, really final language. But she'd been talking about suicide so much that, and all the psychiatrists said, like don't um, don't fan it into flame, okay. you know, because these are it's a suicidal obsession, right? Like you. Um, you can have the thought, oh, I might do that, I might not, I'm gonna choose not to, like trying to be in control of it. So I'm trying to read and study everything I can about how do you help someone who's going through suicidal ideation. But like her last text message to me, this is rough. 
July 23rd of last year, she wrote, giving up my phone now, love you so incredibly much, you are more than I could have ever asked for in a husband. So it's, it's, it's not like see in 30 days. Right. right? Like she, I, I kept trying to talk about Disneyland and how we're going to go to Disneyland finally. Um, and she wouldn't let me talk about that because she just was pot convinced she wasn't going to come out of there. And, and all I had was assurances from the place and from everyone else that this is, this is it. Like we're going to fix it and this is going to be fine. And so um, she won't let me go. The nurse is like calling her back and she's weeping. And it's like, it's so hard to leave your beloved like that. But you know, it's almost like, you know, with your kids, you, when they scream because they don't want to brush their teeth or something like that, you still go, I know what's right now, yeah. you're not making rational decisions, so I need to make rational decisions for right. you. And she's trusted me enough to go, I, I trust what you're doing, but it was still so difficult yeah. because in her head, I'm saying goodbye to you. Right. And so she walks me walk out that door. I think she was already convinced of what she was going to do. And I don't, I don't, I don't know that she wasn't. On the way to the hospital, she tried to jump out of the car oh. on the freeway going 70 miles an hour. Mm. And I grabbed her and I said, like, Paige, if you go out that door, I'm coming with you. Like, if you go out that door, I will chase you on the freeway. And then we're both going to be dead. And our kids are going to be orphans because I'm sticking with you. And that's the only thing that kept her in the door. Like, it, it was just the craziest sequence of events. And, but then I thought, thought, like, man, if I can just get her through these doors and get her in the right hands, yeah. like, it's, it's going to all be worth it. And so what's the setup at this place? She has a room. She has what? What does it look like? Is it like a hospital? Is it no? It's like a resort. So it's like a yeah, like a hotel room. I'm trying yeah. to picture. Yeah. Okay. So, um, a lot of like famous people. If I went down the list of who's been there before, it's like really highly accredited and um, a lot. Yeah, a lot of celebrities have gone through that place, and so it's nice. It. I mean, yeah. it's like there's like a horse ranch there. It's. I mean, everything. It, if if you if it didn't say behavioral health center, it, you would have thought it was a resort. And the lobby is all stone and granite and, you know, mm -hmm. waterfalls and nice little, everything's pristine. And I'm like, okay, good. Like this is, mm -hmm. you know, I know it's going to cost everything to put her in here, but it's like, dude, it's worth it. You right. get your wife back. And um, so there's two sides to it. Apparently there's like the hospital side where it's far more, I don't know if I'm using the right words, hospital or residential, but that's the way yeah. I explain it. Hospital side is like, we watch you all the time, you know, every 30 minutes or something like that, we do our rounds, you've got a little brace that we gotta check in on you, we, we, we tag and make sure that we're watching you. And then the residential side is uh, where you can do a lot more of your therapies, but we gotta get you stable in the hospital before we can get you into the different services. And Paige convinced them that she was ready for the residential side. And so after not that many days, they moved her from the, you know, much more intense watch to the okay. lesser watch, and then. Like three or four days? Yeah. Uh -huh. I remember them telling me that, and I was just, like, so happy. I was like, oh, wow, man, she must be doing a lot better than I thought. But then I would get on the phone with her. I talked to her every day, and I was like, you don't sound great, you know? And so as it, as that goes, then um, they move her over, and they tell me, but they saw all these assurances. Here's how we're going to check on her. Here's what we're going to do. And, um, yeah, there's a lot to be said about, like, the, the protocols that were missed and all those yeah. things that were broken and everything. Because that's one of the main questions people ask is, how the heck did this happen right. inside, of this, inside of this institute? And, um, But it was July 31st. I get a call at 10 in the morning. It's the same time she would have called me any other day. And just by sheer dumb luck, my parents were in town returning my dog who had um, – who had been up in Bakersfield with them. So they brought the dog down and handed it off. And they were there that morning. I got a phone call and I just told everyone in the room, it's Paige. Mm -hmm. So I went upstairs and, and took the phone call and it was her psychiatrist. It was a lawyer. It was the president. It was of the hospital. And they just said, and I'll never forget the way they said it, Mr. Hilkin, um, this morning your wife made an attempt on her life and she was successful. And which is, I mean, obviously what a stupid way of saying it, but right. But, th but it does also cause you to pause more and go, like, what did she just say, you know? And mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so it, apparently she was in there, and then her roommate, she was paired up in a room with somebody, and her roommate, she got, they got called to breakfast. Her roommate went to breakfast, and she stayed behind and um, basically made a, a strangulation device out of her bed sheets and just took her own life in the shower. Um, that's what they found her, and they tried to resuscitate her, obviously, oh. but it was it was just far too late at that point. So that's the phone call that I got, and you know they didn't want to tell you anything, and then yeah. um, they have all these questions, and I'm running through my brain like, what the heck am I gonna do? Like, mm. what do I say? How do I tell people? And that just comes like rushing. 
So that's, you know, I felt like my agenda, just sitting there on the floor of their room going like, I almost felt jealous for my family because they only had about four or five more minutes of normalcy for the rest of their life. Yeah. You know, I get, I'm about to tell you something that's, and so I walked downstairs and they were just, they're jovial and they're having a good time and they're talking through stuff. And I just think to myself, like, you'll never be the same. And right now I just, I want to let you have one more minute of this. Yeah. You know, so I sent the kids upstairs and my dad looked at me and said, what's wrong? What is wrong? And I, uh, I didn't even say her name. I said, she's dead. And he said, who? I said, Paige is dead. And they just collapsed. Everyone is wow. just like folded on themselves, weeping, wailing. You know, it, 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 it seems so indicative of what you would see um, in like a, like a hospital waiting room when someone comes in with that bad news. It was just, it was uncontrolled. And I remember thinking to myself, and I don't know if it's the power of the Holy Spirit or whatever, but I'm weeping. But I just told them, I said, this is going to be the worst day of these five kids' lives. And I want them to be sad. But we right now are their only structure of normalcy and we are their only structure of um, consistency. And so there's going to be time where we can lose it. But right now, we got to get it together and let's have a conversation with these kids and let's answer some good questions and Mm. um, because we're going to be crying for months. But right now, let's... um, they can't come downstairs and see that pop up and Juju have lost it and that dad is inconsolable and those other things. And they need to know that grief's okay and that sadness is okay. But I don't want them to be afraid. That was my big thing. I don't want to instill fear in them. Sadness, great. I know that's going to come. Mm-hmm. I just don't want to feel that. Like, we're not going to be okay. So I brought him down and tried to use the best analogy I had about, like, my dad had cancer, and so I talked about, like, cancer can, when it's fully grown, can consume the body, and it can take its life, and the brain can have cancer, too, when the cancer's full grown, it can take over. So I started using different analogies that they would know from, like, the cartoons that they watch, where someone might physically be in their body, but someone else controls it, you know. Um, there's an episode of SpongeBob SquarePants where this guy named Plankton, like, takes over SpongeBob's body, and I said, that's, that's what happened to mommy. Someone mm. else took over her body, and and told her to take her own life, and that's what she did. And um, I remember, for whatever reason, the moment thinking, "Don't just tell them that she died. Tell them that she killed herself, mm. because then there's going to be a whole new wave. Because yeah. they're going to ask. That's what they're going to ask. How did she die? Right. And it's like just all at once. And let's let the healing begin, starting in that very moment. And and we'll find out when they get older if that was the right or wrong thing to do. But that's just what my gut told me. And to answer those questions, you know, it's it's kind of like people who are adopted. They're they're kind of finding out that you. The old system of you don't tell the person they're ever adopted is gone. You know, you, you let them know from day one and you walk them through those struggles. And so that's what I did. And, and now your kids are how old at this point? Uh, you're sitting there having this conversation. Six, five, three, one, and three months. months yeah. Four months. Okay. And so this conversation, how did they absorb that? Or did they? How does that even? So much of it, I think, is mirroring. Um, yeah. My oldest got it. Peyton understood, and he lost it. And he just crawled up into my arms, and I wept with him. He didn't want to leave me. So um, Harper was my, is my daughter, my oldest daughter, and she was a little bit more, she, you could tell she was immediately afraid. So almost like nervous in the room, but really taking cues from everyone else. And I knew they would. I knew they would take cues from us. And I think she looked around and saw everyone sad, but... but um, still under control, and I think she wanted, in some cases, to to be like that too. Mm. My son Brady didn't get it, so he was he's my three year old at the time, and he just said, "Wait, hold on, mom's coming home." Mm. No, no, mom's not coming home. Well, when is she coming home? She's not gonna come home. When? Never. She's never coming home. Mm. And that took a while for him to get mm. that, and it's just horrific because you have to use these analogies, you know, like. You're, you know, this pet is never coming back. That's the same thing as what's going to happen to mommy. Like, you're never, you're not going to see her again this side of eternity. And, um, and then you got to explain mental health. Like, how, and you can't explain mental health to a 30 year old. How do you explain to a three year old? Right. And so that was a process of like illustration and allu- like using different allusions to other things that they might understand. And, but, Peyton didn't want to leave me, so I knew I needed to go up and call her mom and her dad and my brother and her sister and, so I sat on the floor of a room and it was just like, it was like death by a thousand paper cuts. Just every time, like I would scroll through and I would see like her dad's name and I would just go like, what? Oh, yeah. Like just, like how do you call 
and tell him mm-hmm. that. And so the word starts to get out in my community and everything. And within, you know, 20, 30 minutes, there's just this line of people at my house. And it's, it's almost like that Jewish like sh- concept of Shiva where you just sit with someone when they're wailing. Mm-hmm. And I sat in my son's room where I got the phone call and where I was making phone calls. And Larry Osborne was there and just sat with me. And um, my buddy Austin, my buddy Jake, and this, you know, my family members, they're just sitting with me in a room. They're not saying anything. They're just being with me while I just, I just try to figure out what my life's going to be. And I, I just remember thinking over and over again, are my kids going to be okay? Yeah. Like, they will not, nothing about their life's going to be normal now. Mm-hmm. All of their, every testimony they ever give, when they ever sit in a podcast someday, they're going to go, well, my mom killed herself when I was four years old. Right. Like, that's just, that's going to be the staple foundation of their story. Mm-hmm. Just how, well, they don't deserve this. So, mm-hmm. that, ju- I mean, then it just, it just felt like the fog. And Rick Warren called me the next day. His son um, committed yeah. suicide not that long ago, so he was like generous enough to reach out and to call. And, and he he talked to me about like the fog of this, and you know, the, the deeper the agony, the fewer the words. And so he was helpful with some of those different concepts. And I remember thinking to myself early on, like, man, I think I'm handling this pretty well. I think I'm like ba- back at like what. And then something would remind you of it, and you yeah. would just be gone. And and that's every six months, I look on myself six months back and go, dude, you were so unhealthy, but you thought you were okay. Because I put it this way, like, when you ask me how am I doing in 2018, my scale went from, like, zero to 100. So my good day was, like, 90 and above. I feel like since Paige died, especially in the first few months, my scale went up to 20 max. Mm. So when you asked how I was doing, if I said good, I meant I was at an 18. Mm. That's a good illustration. When I was yeah. bad, I was at a 7. So everything's like, it's comparative, yeah. right? Now that I'm a year and a half later, my scale might only go to 75. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm having an okay day if I were Chris in three years ago. Yeah. And I'm having a great day as modern day Chris. And that just keeps, it, it gets stronger as the days and months go on. But it's just, it's a, it's a cloud that it's never felt relief. I, I, there's never a moment where it's not penetrating some area of my thought life. Yeah. Um, to this point at least and it seems like for a lot of people people in the widow and widower community that's a that's a truism for a long time you're probably wondering could have I done more was there something yeah. we could have done I mean there's so many questions that are swimming around that would that would be tough bro and people are jerks awesome. yeah like I the, the best analogy that I have is if I'm playing on a basketball team with Steph Curry and the other people get a technical foul, right? That means that my team's awarded two shots in the ball and we're down by two points. And they say, who's gonna take these free throws? The correct answer is Steph Curry. Now, there's a world in which he misses two and I make two. But with the knowledge that I have in that moment, you would have been so dumb to say me and not Steph Curry. That would have made no sense. So with the information you have at the time, and again, it wasn't like my calls. I wasn't shooting from the hip. I'm not some like professional, like mental health expert. And that's what's even hard since she died. Whenever I tell my story, people come up and go, my wife's going through the same thing. What should I do? It's like, bro, I don't know. Right. I don't know. Like I'm, I'm a victim of this. You know what I mean? It's like someone getting a car accident, being asking them to work on your motor. It's like, I don't, yeah. I just, I, I've been hit by the tragedy of it. I, I don't claim to have any success in it. But for me, it was hands up. Like whatever my team thinks I should do, I should do. And 100 times out of 100, I would do what they said over what I think because they're smarter than I am. But you get at people who say stuff like, oh, man, you needed to, she just needed to go back to her hometown and remember her, where her roots were. And I remember her psychiatrist telling me one time, when anyone tells you that, just tell them, if you would have, if you would have gone with what you were thinking, you would have found her hanging in your barn. Mm-hmm. If you gone with what you were thinking, you would have found her in your closet. You would have found her these places. She's like, she was suicidal. She couldn't be talked out of it. She needed professional help. Unfortunately, the institution let her down and did not follow through with what they were said they were going to do, but she was in the right place. She was in the best place, and she was in the right place at the time. Best place meaning she, she belonged in a long-term inpatient center. Was it the right place in the country? I thought it was. Apparently, it wasn't. But um, that's my best analogy. Is like I, Makes sense, yeah. That's all you can do. You yeah. can make the best decision with the information before you, even though there's a world in which I make the free throws and Steph doesn't. Um, it's like a coach, it's the coach's hindsight is 2020. Right. You go for two, or you go for one, right? You don't go for two, and you if you go for two and you make it, you're a hero. And if you don't, you're a goat, and you don't know until it happens. Right. But you go with the analytics, you go with the data, you go with thousands of people's experience and 
best guess. And that's just what I try to do. So yeah. that's been great to have that strong of a team that I, I don't think back on anything and go, I would have done this differently. I do think to myself, what if I would have done this differently? Yeah. Because you never know what formula could have worked. But I don't ever think to myself, would I have done that differently? Because I never would have done anything differently. Yeah. I would have submitted to what they said. Right. That's what I did. Which, yeah, like you said, I mean, that makes sense. Now, back to what you said, because people have their own opinions and theories, and like you mentioned, you know, people can be jerks, actually, through this. And some of the things that people don't understand, it's different than your puppy, or it's different than this when they come up and right. say things. And so... Um, that's something I think people need to know. Like when someone goes through something, don't pretend like it's the same thing or you understand the same thing or whatever. And you've had to deal with that, yeah. right? People saying just ridiculous things. Right. And that's something that, I mean, how does that, how does that make you feel? And can we learn something from that? Like, shut up. Like, yeah. Sometimes just pray for it, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I've tried to like coach some of my friends in post, because in the in the moment, like, and this is what I've had to realize, like, just like being a widower doesn't come with a manual, neither does being friends with a widower. Mm. And and here's something that's that's crazy, and it's kind of sad, but it's true. Widows and widowers lose seventy five percent of their of their support group when their wife or husband dies. Wow. And a lot of it comes to I don't know how to deal with you. Yeah. I don't know what to say. I remember one of my friends telling me one time, tonight was so great. It was it was like you used to be. And when they said that, I thought to myself, I'm burdening you with my grief, aren't I? Mm. And here's what, I love the way that one uh, pastor put it. Um, grief has a longer half-life than sympathy does. Mm. Um, grief lasts longer than sympathy. And that's why you'll find a lot of widowers jumping from community to community because you, you're, you're not done grieving, and sometimes your, your community is. And so they don't know what to do with you. But then you feel like the drag. You feel you're like... Like whenever I bring up Paige, people kind of wince. Like, we don't uncomfortable. Talk about that. Yeah, it's like, yeah. oh, you don't talk about that. Yeah, I can't stop thinking about it. So mm -hmm. like, I'm sorry I made you uncomfortable. But, and then you get other people who like, they were they were friends of our marriage, their marriage and our marriage. Right, I was friends with him. She was friends with her. And now what do you do? Like, you two come over and hang out with me. Yeah, right. Like you just like, well, how does that even look? And yeah. when you talk about what to say, I would coach him. I said like. I, I told my friends, I said, if, if, you're, if you've got another friend and if I, if I have a friend and my friend is a 32-year-old single widower of five kids who lost their wife to suicide, I still would never walk up to them and say, I know what you're going through right. because the dynamics of situations, the dynamics of your past, the way that your parents interact, the, the support you have from your community, the church, that your faith structure, your, the way that you responded to it, how much resentment you had, how much regret you have, what kind of suicide it was. Was it psychosis? Was it depression? Was it postpartum? What, like, what was it? There's a thousand different variables that all lead to one conclusion. You have no clue what I'm going through. And, and comparative grief is like, it's insulting. Right? I had someone come up to me and go like, I know what you're going through. My, my um, football coach in high school killed himself. Explain to me how you know what I'm going through. Right. And, and you'll, you, you won't find widows and widowers saying that phrase to each other mm -hmm. because they know how bad it's things. So I've just, I told them, like, your favorite phrase to talk to someone in deep grief is, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. I, have, I can't imagine what you're going through. I, got, I don't even know what to say except I love you and I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. It's like profound. And that's what Rick Warren said. The deeper the tragedy, the fewer the words. Mm. Like if someone approached me with a Bible verse, I'm like, bro, first of all, you think I don't know that verse? Secondly, that's not helpful right now. Right. Like part of my healing process is I'm going to get mad at God and I'm going to need probably a season where you let me do that. Right. Yeah. And the Bible canonizes anger at God. Mm -hmm. The Psalms, right? You're mad at God. God's like, print that. We're yeah. going to call that one Psalm 73. Mm -hmm. I'll print that one. That's Psalm 13. That one's Psalm 10. That's in Psalm 22. He continually canonizes anger towards him. And we try to get rid of it with yeah. each other. As if God can't take it. As if he's too insecure in himself. Or, right? For 37 chapters in the book of Job, God listens to Job tell him how he's doing such a bad job. Now, God responds. It says, out of the whirlwind. And says, embrace yourself because I'm going to treat you. I'm going to respond to you like a man. And he basically asks him, hey, where were you when I laid the first earth's foundation? What were you doing? When I built up the storehouses of snow, what were you, were you a part of that? I didn't think so. And it leads Job to finish 
the whole book by saying like, you're God and I'm not. And, and, and I'm gonna need that experience and I've had that experience now where God has shown his sovereignty and his power to me. But he also gave me 37 chapters where I could just go, what the heck, man? Yeah, I'm so mad at you. And people always try to downplay like, well, don't be mad at God. It's like, dude, that's, that's absolutely part of the process. Yeah, that's part of the process, like you just said. And take us through some of that. Like, so you're, it's just still fresh, 18 months, but you've had a season and I'm sure there's still times. There's some anger. There's some of that. But you, you go through this season. It starts with anger. I mean, there's obviously incredible grief. You're angry, though, too, about God. And here's, here's a pastor. And how are you dealing with that? How do, you, do you have an outlet? Are you journaling? Are you just saying it in prayer? Are you just pushing God away? During that season, what's going on? Part of the apologetics thing that I talked to you about, made it so that, like, I, I, I couldn't go, fine, then there must not be a God. Like, I was just way too convinced that there was. So for me, it was more wrestling with, like, God's goodness. I think I still wrestle with some of those characteristics. It's not his goodness as much, but his gentleness is hard, you know? Like, if the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, gentleness is difficult. It's like, bro, in the middle of this, like, I'm trying to teach your word. Like, are you going to make me an example? Tell me how you're a gentle God in the middle of this. And I, th- I think sometimes too, even early on, I would look for the redemption of the story as if that's somehow promised too, meaning that God was going to take this and I think he's going to absolutely reap glory from my story. But the idea of I'm going to look back on this someday with 2020 vision and go, I am so glad that took place, right. you know, and I don't, that's not, seems like it's promised in scripture either. Mm-hmm. A lot of my anger was just from, I, when you look at the text, when you look at biblical heroes, when you look at faith heroes, when you look at modern heroes, like C.S. Lewis lost his wife, you know, you've got um, the guy who wrote It Is Well With My Soul, which is one of the great anthems yeah. of the Christian faith, historically writes that when he's looking at the spot where his wife and kids were on a boat that sunk in the middle of the Atlantic, and he writes that song, you know, when, when, uh, when, sorrows like sea billows roll, I will trust in you through all things, it is well with my soul, like, I just, my anger was like, is this your big plan to make me a little bit more dynamic as a communicator? Like, is this so I can have some stupid testimony that I have to give places, you know? Hmm. I was resentful, you know? I was like, pick someone else, you know? Like, pick that dude over there. He's like, you know, he's a new pastor. He doesn't have, he doesn't have a wife and kids. Like, do something to him. Like, leave me alone, you know? And, mm-hmm. it, and it was, but I get mad at Paige, Bro, I still get mad at Paige. Sure. Like when I think about dating ever again and like jumping back in that world, I get so mad. I'm like, it was the best. I yeah. love being married to you. Why did you do this? Um, mm-hmm. That anger is just like pervasive. I get mad at my friends because they don't know what to say. And and grief is kind of like a sieve too. It, it does this weird thing where it catches fake friendships too and it throws mm. them out. And you go, that's what I told people. I was like, dude, if you're not with me right now, what good is your friendship? Like tell me, tell me a tell me a time in my life where I would need you more. Like if you can't be here now, you're not going to be here then, and it might just all be fictitious. And so, grief does weird stuff. And so you get angry at that. You get angry at church. You get angry at pastors. You get angry at leaders. You get angry at, and part of it's their own fear. They don't know what to do, so they they just walk away, you know, and then, or, or like responsibility theory, you know, especially in a big church, everyone assumes someone else is doing something all the time and then no one does anything, Mm -hmm. right? There was like this uh, story from New York where this woman was getting raped in the middle of the street and there was like 37 or 39 witnesses. I can't remember what it was, but no one called the police Mm -hmm. because everyone thought that someone else was going to call the police. That can happen too. We are sitting there and you're like, uh, for the first couple of months before my sister-in-law basically quit her job to come and help me and she's, she is the hero of the story because she has made it and given me margin in my life to process and to heal and to grieve and do all those things. But for two months, I didn't have anyone. I would sit at home with five kids, not knowing which way was up, crying, grieving myself, feeding a newborn baby, trying to wrestle through these things, trying to answer my kids' grief. I remember so many days we'd spend, we're all crying on a bed asking why mommy's gone. And like, there's no one there. And you talk to people and they go like, well, I'm sure you have so much help. It's like, well, Brenda, you're wrong. No one's here right now. And I, and I don't think it's because they, I, I don't, and, and I, Bob Goff said this a few days ago. I was, I was listening to something he was, right, he was saying. People in grief don't know how to ask you for help. Yeah. I don't know what I need from you. So Bob says like, make a suggestion. Like, hey, I'm going to come wash your car. Don't even come outside unless you want to. But 
your car is going to be washed by the time you're done. Hey, there's going to, um, you're going to, there's Chipotle sitting in your front porch. You can throw it away if you want to. You can give it to your dogs. You can give it to your neighbors, whatever you want to do. But just Chipotle there. I didn't want to say hi. I know you got a lot going on. Or just availability. Yeah. And they don't want to do that. People don't want to do it. Now I do because now I've gone through it. Yeah, but I don't it. want anyone else to have to go through that to understand that. And so you have to just give grace on grace on grace, but it still sucks. Yeah. It's still hurtful. So you go through that. You're now uh, 18 months or so past, and you're going, uh, at what point are you thinking, I think, I think I am still going to be in ministry, or I still sense a call on my life, or did you think, a, was there a time where you're like, uh, I don't think so? Kind of take me through that process of really realizing, wait a minute, God has gifted me, and, and I am called to do this. This certainly is going to always be part of my life and my story, but he has this for me. Kind of share so while I was angry at God, I was more angry at Satan and sin. Yeah. And I felt like every time I can tell my story, I redeem this really crappy situation a little bit more. Every time I do, Satan doesn't get victory. Every time, every time my story is used to bring someone to Christ, Jesus wins. Yeah. And, and maybe early on, I wasn't even so excited that Jesus was winning because I was mad at him, but I was really happy that Satan was losing, yeah. right? So it was, I, I liked the idea that my story was being used to tick off the one responsible for all mm -hmm. of it. I like that yeah. a lot. Yeah, that's good. As my heart has been healing, it's a duality. I still love the fact that every time what the enemy meant for evil, God turns into good. I still love that. But now I, I just find such catharsis. I think you asked it to me after I told my story here at Skyline, like, how was that for you? It's like, well, it stings like a bed of nails. And then I always feel a deep catharsis afterwards. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's almost like a communion that I still have with Paige where I finish the story and I just go, even as you left, you left with a testimony that's being used to change lives. Like, thank you for your faithfulness throughout your whole life mm -hmm. and even your faithfulness. She, she explained the gospel to me the day before she passed away. Someone had called her and said, like, if you kill yourself, you're going to hell. Mm -hmm. So she called me and she for whatever, and whatever, I don't even know how she did it, but with every bit of wherewithal, she walked me through Romans Road and told me what the gospel was and why she was saved and why that what that person said wasn't true. Mm. And that was within 36 hours of her passing wow. away. She, and that's just been this life gift to me where mm. I know exactly where she stood on all these things. I, and no matter how much control that sickness had over her brain, when the rubber met the road, she still was able to properly dictate the gospel. And that's been the, something that I've been able to cling to ever since then. It's just been one of the greatest life gifts through all this stuff. But that's that ministry thing. Is like, I, how do you take me through this and I not use it for right. your kingdom? It's not that it's fun to do so. And you also don't want to be the guy who like, you know, I remember James Conner a few years ago. He's a running back. He was played for the Steelers. He said, I don't want to be the, the cancer guy. I don't want to like walk around for the rest of my life being the cancer guy. And mm. um, my mentor told me one time, he's like, tough. <laughs> Like, that's just who you're going to be. Yep. You're going to be the guy who lost his wife and overcame through the power of the gospel and trusted God in spite of all the darkness. Mm. You know, like, that's just the way that God has written your script. And right, if you've ever seen an Olympian who finishes the Olympics and they're a Christian, they always bring their medals with them and they always talk about what it means to run the good race, you know, all those things. And so he's like this... There, your story in the Christian church is so rare. Like, how dare you think of it as anything other than a gift that God has given now in retrospect to mm. say, I want you to use this for my kingdom. Mm -hmm. So for me, it, that was kind of like all part. I and mean, I've watched God's faithfulness in the story. Like teaching at youth camps to people who are struggling with anxiety and depression and suicidal ideation to talk about God's redemption through it and His the power to overcome, but then also to worship God when there isn't that success or those other things like... I've just watched his faithfulness, and I just really feel like, God, it's your story now. Just wherever you want me to tell it, however you want me to, and whatever you make from me is, is awesome. So. And so now you're, you're sharing that. Obviously, you've shared it here at Skyline, which had encouraged uh, so many people. And now, is that what you see as your calling? What's next for you? Is that your call? I'm going to go speak in places and share the story. I'm thinking about planting a church, or I might lead a church someday. Kind of, what are you, what's your, where's God leading you at this time? Those are all like great questions. And I, I feel like it, you ask me that on any given week and the answer changes, yeah. which is why my mentorship and the people, the spiritual guides of my life have kind of said like, <laughs> until that remains consistent for a while, you should probably be careful. <laughs> 
careful, you know? It's like, <laughs> you, sure. you don't want to get a puppy when you're like, today I want a puppy, tomorrow I don't. Yeah. It's like, once you get one, you're kind of there. And <laughs> so uh, I, I've, I've thought about planting. Um, I've thought about, but, but like in the, my family all lives in Bonzel with me, but that's also like where the church is that I taught at. And so, um, you know, they don't obviously want me planting near them mm-hmm. because they want, you know, the, they don't want me to be near their church. And so, well, it's like, well, and I can't really move for, I can't plant somewhere else because now my whole family structure has moved down to help me. And so it's like, okay, do you, do you, um, do you pastor at another church? And it's like, well, that, so because all that is so unclear, I feel like it's been a really cool season. Um, like I said, especially with like the, the generosity of people and everything that I can, I don't, uh, you know, it's like when you walk into Costco, when you're hungry, you often make bad decisions about what to buy, you know, <laughs> oh, like yeah. you get those like pretzels with like the peanut butter in them and it's like, <laughs> yeah. it tastes great, but you're hungry. Like if you go to Costco on a full stomach, you get your grocery list. Right. If you go and you're hungry, like a little bit of beef jerky, I'm going to sample this thing over here. You just, you you know, buy more. So I think that's part of it for me. And there's such an itch to get back into ministry that like people like Skyline and stuff have helped me to scratch that to go, man, I love being around people again. I don't see myself doing like itinerant speaking as a profession because I love the work of the pastorate. Yeah. I love, you know, I've, I've taught at Skyline here two or three times. And now I start to see people after the service who come up to me, the same ones. And yeah. I'm like, oh, Donna, oh, Frank, oh, yeah. Carl, oh, Greg, Jenny. And I can start going, oh, this is the conversations we've been having. And like, that's, I miss that. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't think I'm built to just be the guy who travels around and speaks, but I don't know exactly what God has for me next. Good. Well, he's got a place here at Skyline, so <laughs> until he figures that out, we know that's going to be the case for a while at least. And and uh, how can people be praying for you? I think that's probably going to be one of the thoughts as people listen to this and watch this. They're going to be going, man, how can I pray for Chris? How can I help Chris and the family? So much of its clarity. It's what you talked about just a second ago. and. um I'm kind of a deep roots, not really a transient soul. And so whatever is next, I want to make sure that it's inside of what God has for me and that it's best for the kids, that it's best for um, for what God's kingdom wants me to do and, and what I'm what I'm supposed to do. So I think that clarity is a big thing. The wisdom piece is big. Uh, and then uh, just any sense of balance. You know, I, I feel like it's going into a season now where there is a little bit more margin in my life and then just being wise with what I do with that margin and um, and then probably the last thing is be effectiveness and, and the catalytic nature of what God's doing in that story that um, that he would just be glorified through all of this stuff yeah. and whatever it's going to be. So I think for us personally, a lot of it ha- revolves around wisdom and, and clarity of what do we do and what do we say yes to and what do we say no to. And yeah. um, I think wisdom too. And like, I still get, I get asked, asked these questions by my kids all the time. Like, my son asked me that day, how did mom kill herself? You're like, oh, jeez, man. Or, um, you know, my son Brady, he, I, I t- today I was sitting on the couch and I was explaining to my daughter Finley, I was showing her pictures of mom and going, mama, this is mama. Mm-hmm. Like, that's just not something you have to do. Yeah. You don't, you shouldn't have to explain to your kid who mama is. Um, mm-hmm. So it seemed that there's, there's a lot more of those conversations that are pretty pivotal and knowing what to say and what not to say and how to guide them. I would love prayer on that because you can get whatever seminary degree you want, but right. that's not part of the process. Right. Here's how you answer your kids after your wife has committed suicide. Like that's yeah. just, it's not a course. Not a course. Nope. So now you, your family moved down. Your dad was a pastor. Did he, he moved down, right? Yeah. To, to talk about that for a moment. It was one of those days I was talking to you about where I was on the bed with all my kids and I called my, I tried to FaceTime my parents and I just like, Peyton was crying, Harper was crying, I was talking about making dinner, you know, and when I say making dinner, I mean, what am I going to put in the oven? Um, so I'm like getting taquitos ready and everything, and I called mm-hmm. my parents to check in on them, and I just couldn't get a word out, because I was just crying, mm-hmm. and I and I was trying to hold it together, because I, you know, you want that badge of honor, like, I can do this, I can take care of everything, and I remember my mom asked, like, do we need to move down there? And everything in my world, it's almost like I told myself, say no. But the word yes came out. Mm. And my my parents, as, as true as the North Star, said, okay, we're going to start that process. Wow. Like, it wasn't even a question. Like, they had always planned on moving closer after my dad retired. My dad's had an amazing church up in Bakersfield, and they'd have had an, an amazing 20 years of ministry there. And But they just uprooted their lives. And my mom was running a Pilates studio, and my dad was doing this, and they have great friends, and their wine group, they love, they're like winos and everything. And 
and they've picked up their life and they've moved down the street from me to be present. And like I said, my sister-in-law who was running a full-time job and making great money and doing all the stuff in her career just said, I'm cutting down to part-time, which then they said, we need you to either go full-time or to quit. And she quit. Wow. And so she's like helping her uh, parents do some financials on the computer. Parents own a uh, really cool hay business up in Northern California. So she's doing stuff with them, but then she's kind of like full-time uh, in our, in our house and taking care of stuff. And like, those are the heroes of this story. And that's, what's been so amazing with us kind of stuff. So yeah, they're coming alongside family pulling together and it's phenomenal. I think, I think probably the way to maybe put a bow on this is to talk about, um, your fandom for the Dodgers. And let's just be honest, because if we talk about prayer, this is something that we could pray for Chris about, (laughs) Yes. Like a lot of prayer. For he, he likes the Dodgers. Like, what? and so it's okay because we're here as a church. No perfect people, right? It's it. You get it. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. You're you such a it. jerk sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> and so we're here for you. No, but honestly, yes, thank you for just your transparency, your authenticity, and sharing that. I know that's going to help a lot of people. Um, and so we appreciate you taking time to, to be with us and, and people will be praying as you shared those prayer needs. And of course, Skyline is here for you. And we're grateful that you'll be teaching here, that you do teach here and, and people are going to love on you and you got a home here always. So thanks, man. appreciate you, brother. Thanks guys. Thank you for joining us on faith and culture podcast and make sure you like and comment and do all those things. Uh, and also, uh, join us for our next podcast coming up and like, and subscribe, and we'll see you guys next time.